Hello and welcome. On today's episode, we welcome Chris Harris, the safety dog. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is, this is a fun one as you, I think, are my first other podcast host to talk to. <laughs> so <laughs> you're very familiar with the background and the platform of which we are speaking currently. Yeah, I've, I've been blessed to have, I think I'm up to 54, 55 episodes now I've released. So nice. I'm excited about that. Well, you've got some catching up to do, but clearly, uh, like, like ourselves, it's sort of a newer venture. What, um, how did you get involved in this industry? Um, yeah. Uh, let's, let's start about the trucking industry or, or talk sure. about that. So, I mean, literally my uh, history goes all the way back to my grandfather. Oh, wow. A video of a, uh, a truck trying to pull a U-turn on the Esplanade <laughs> in Toronto with the Red Path sugar silos in the background back in the 60s so my grandfather and my dad both own trucking companies i still have a class a in my pocket i've worked for trucking companies for probably the until i was about 45 or so um and then i was blessed with a job in the insurance industry <laughs> uh, the, the trucking insurance uh companies all have people like myself with a safety background working for them to help um, mitigate the risk of, of bringing on carriers and working with the carriers. So I did that. And then about seven years ago, I started my own company. Yay! <laughs> you know, Very nice. That's real quick. That's my background. I was a driver, a uh, operations manager, a safety guy, and then worked for an insurance company before starting this deal. Excellent. So yes, yeah, so that brings you to today where you are the safety dog. And as you mentioned, started in 2013, I believe. That's where you got started. God, is it that long ago? I started in, yeah, it must have been 2013, I guess. It goes fast. 2014. Yep. <laughs> Somewhere in there. Excellent. And then I, I guess for those who don't know, give us a bit of background of what, what the safety dog does and provides for, uh, I guess, for fleets. Well, the how I, it came about um, is as a safety guy working for the insurance company, I was going out to see all these fleets. And they were spending a lot of money on some pretty poor safety consultants out there. And um, a situation happened at my work that I no longer fit in at my corporate job. So I thought I'm going to go and start to be a safety consultant and really bring my goal is to bring the best value for the buck to fleets. And, you know, most of my fleets are 50 trucks and less because if they're larger than 50 trucks, they should have somebody that knows pretty much what I know. But, you know, the 25 truck fleets, the 10 truck fleets, they can't afford to have somebody on staff with all the knowledges or all the knowledge in every area. So um, that's who usually hires me and brings me in. And I come in anywhere from one day a week in the beginning. Most of my clients I go see either monthly or quarterly uh, just to keep keep them on track and, and um, build a rapport with the safety uh, and insurance companies that work with them. Excellent. And it makes sense. Like you said, the smaller companies, whether they're starting out or just, you know, yeah. inherently that size, um, yeah, don't always have the means to, to have dedicated people on site. But the benefit of what you bring is the expertise, the knowledge, and they can benefit from that while, you know, still keeping a company the size they're at. Hey, well said. I should have said it. <laughs> and then, of course, that's led you into the, the podcast and YouTube channel, which I guess is a, a way to get the voice out of what you do in uh, in a different format that, you know, we, we, we are seeing definitely is being absorbed more and more often. Uh, the podcast on the audio side, the YouTube channel is great. You know, you, you do the live videos or just, you know, where there's quick hits on segments. Um, and it, it's part of, you know, what I wanted to chat with you about today was, this is kind of a new emerging, it's not a new emerging technology, but definitely in our industry, we tend to be slower to adapt to the newer trends. And how did you get started digging into the podcast and YouTube uh, version of, of what you provide to your clients? Well, first of all, it was pre-COVID. Um, <laughs> I decided to do a podcast. And part of it was because I like technology and I like learning new stuff. Um, the other part is that because I'm in my 60s now, I know a lot of people in the trucking industry. And I've been blessed that every time I've reached out, 
the people have always said, yeah, sure, I'll come on a show and talk about myself. <laughs> so I've been blessed to be able to interview some really neat guests and learn more about acquaintances um, and new friends, because some of these people that I've reached out to, uh, for instance, like yourself, you're going to come on the show and yep. we'd never met yet, but True. Uh, through a, uh, well, through Guy, Guy um, uh, Broderick, sorry, brain fart as to who it was, but uh, through Guy Broderick, uh, I found out about you and I found out about your podcast and I reached out and said, Hey, can we do something together? So I'm blessed to be on your show. And, uh, I'm looking forward to talking about uh, Rush on my show. Here you go. And that's the, the value of the industry. It's, I mean, it's, it's so small. It's very tight-knit. And I've had other conversations with, with other people about it. And, you know, and one of the things I, I had mentioned was, you know, I started in it 20 years ago. I left for a while. And when I came back, it was like you never left. And you kind of, you know, all your old friends are there. When, but it's everybody knows everybody. Um, and if you don't know somebody, one phone call usually puts you in touch with the person you're trying to reach. And I think, you know, like you said, our, our conversation here today is a good example of that. Yeah, it doesn't take much in our industry um, because it is so, it, in Canada, it is a small industry. And then when we talk about trucking safety, it's really a small industry. Yes. Yeah, no, definitely. But it's a it's a key part of it. And, you know, it's been, I'd say under the microscope, it seems to come and go. Um, you know, we, a couple of years ago, we had a lot of issues with the, the, the wheel offs causing, you know, and especially in the media and obviously legitimately concerns over the safety of that. And the Saskatchewan crash with the Humboldt victims, that was a, a huge, you know, eye opener to the safety. Uh, so there's been, you know, media challenges with regards to the I guess the perception of, of fleet safety and definitely puts an onus on the fleets to ensure that they are, you know, above and beyond compliance with regards to safety and requirements. And the, the other part of that is the insurance component. The, the insurance providers uh, historically in trucking just haven't been making a, a profit or a, if they have been making a profit, it hasn't been enough. Uh, to satisfy shareholders and you know I know some people are cringing when I say things like that because it, it just it with the rates that they're charging it doesn't seem that it could be possibly true that they're not making enough money because the rates are are really horrendous but I can tell you that right now we are in the hardest insurance market that I've ever seen and I joined the insurance company in 2001 and and the insurance brokers that I work with, they tell me the same thing. This is unprecedented. If you have any wrinkles in your history, and by wrinkles, I'm talking about like a conditional CVOR rating, for instance, that is going to devastate you when it comes to insurance renewal. So it's just anything like that, your FMCSA, your driver uh, hiring packages, the, the insurance company and the industry right now is treating trucking companies harder and are more stringent, I believe, than even MTO is at the moment. And that's interesting. And part of why we wanted to chat with you today was specifically with CVOR and kind of for the companies, there's been a lot of new companies or a lot of especially growing companies, I'd say in the last handful of years that we're seeing emerge, especially in the, the GTA, Southern Ontario area, the market you know, was booming and companies seem to be popping up everywhere. And so with that, you know, a lot of it, and then I come across it even in, in what I'm doing is guys have come from smaller trucks, smaller fleets, rentals, and then moving into their own equipment and then going, oh, we need a CVR. Well, what's that? <laughs> and so, yep. you know, with, with your background and knowledge for the layman's term for, for that guy who's getting into his first commercial vehicle uh, that they're going to own or have in their name. What, uh, you know, what are the things they need to understand about the CVR and how it impacts their business? Well, first of all, it is, it is everything to their business, or, or largely. Um, if the truck is going to be registered for a gross weight of 4,500 kgs or more, then you need a CVR. And by the way, so the reason I mentioned the actual number is that it's really important. A lot of landscape pickup truck owners for instance, as soon as they hook up a trailer, all of a sudden they have made a CVOR vehicle. And if the trailer is heavy enough, 
then you may need an A restricted license to be pulling that trailer. It can get really complicated. But you know, for most of the listeners, I would think we're talking about straight trucks that are registered with a gross vehicle weight of more than 11,000 kg or tractor trailers. So for sure, in those cases, you need a CVR. And in that case, whenever you need a CVR, there's all kinds, there's a 300 page book that MTO has written, um, which is a, it's an awesome read if you want to fall asleep at night. <laughs> and, but in the book, and this is, nobody ever reads it. And the, in the book, they tell you exactly what do they want to see in driver files? What do they want to see in maintenance files? What are your responsibilities as a trucking company owner uh, to the public? And so they've got it all really well laid out, thankfully. And I mean, that's our taxpayer dollars. But I, I really think MTO did a good job in trying to give owners an idea of what's, what their responsibilities are. I mean, in this book, they say specifically, hey, training. And here's a list of subjects we want to see you train in. Well, it makes it pretty simple. Unfortunately, most people don't read the book. So, you know, <laughs> it, it has ratings. And I already mentioned CBR conditional rating. If, yeah. if your rating is conditional or worse, there is a rating that's worse, but I can't imagine you getting insurance if it's worse. Um, really reach out to a safety consultant in your area and get them to help you because the insurance industry, if they haven't already, they're going to come in and knock on your door and say, hey, this is going to be a really tough renewal you know, or talk to your insurance broker about it, because I hate hearing that good companies, and, th and this has happened, good companies go out of business, or they go to the facility market, right? The facility market is that thing that costs you uh, your firstborn child to get insurance. And it, cause it is uh, at least triple the regular market rates. That's, that's crazy. And I guess the, having knowledge of what's expected, like anything else, especially in the business, but with the MTO and especially when they've laid it out for you in a very finely detailed 300 page document, um, it doesn't give you, I guess, much leg to stand on when, when, when you, you know, are not in compliance and, you know, with that, and when you get involved and you get pulled in, what, what are the common, you know, trends of infractions you're seeing? Is there a certain thing that, you know, you see a lot of fleets doing or is it all over the map? No, there's, usually some pretty common things. Um, you know, a vehicle inspection not documented, or as it's often referred to, a pre-trip. Uh, pre-trips aren't done. Or if they're running an ELD, a pre-trip is done in three minutes. And here, that op when the officer sees a three or five minute pre-trip, they say, well, you know, driver, do you got your schedule one? And, and God help us. I hope the driver has their schedule one. But assuming they do, the officer then says, well, driver, can you explain to me how you inspected all 23 of these items in five minutes? And if the driver says something like, well, you know, the ELD was slow today and it was downloading the information. So I started doing it. Well, that allows the officer to write a falsification ticket because your vehicle inspection has to be done while on duty. And if you just admitted you did it while not on <laughs> duty, that's an easy ticket. Um, and the other one, of course, is when the driver says, well, you know what, geez, I did it yesterday, eh? Oh. <laughs> uh, again, and another easy ticket. And, and I mean, I do a whole presentation on easy tickets. It just reminded me, but think of it this way. Do officers have to write tickets? And I think everybody would say, yeah, if they don't write tickets, their boss is going to say, why aren't you writing more tickets? Right. So every officer's got to write tickets. And, and I have a whole list of what I call easy tickets. Why well, make it easy for the guys? They, they do a great job, whether they're police or MTO, they do a great job in keeping our roads safe. But. On the other hand, I really want the, the truck drivers to make it a little bit harder for them to write tickets. I really enjoy that. So Yeah, no, and that's, and that's fair. And you, like you said, it shouldn't be something blatantly simple that you just missed in error, right? You want, to, you want them to be catching the things that should be caught. 
that maybe was missed by one set of eyes, but caught by another set of eyes. That's kind of, you know, what you're looking for. And I remember we had a presentation with the guys from the MTO years ago with my association and someone raised their hand and said, you know, why do you, why do you never pull over the new trucks? You're always pulling over all the old trucks and skewing all the numbers. And they're like, oh, but that's why we're trying to find the stuff that's probably been band-aid, you know, patched up, missed on a pre-trip. The new truck's not saying there's anything not going to be wrong with them, but less likely of finding an infraction, you know, on, and especially if they're doing a blitz on certain things on a new truck versus an old truck. So same thing here. If you're, if there's simple things you can do to keep yourself in good CVR standing, like a proper pre-trip while on duty, then, you know, that'll give them time to actually walk around the truck and try and, you know, hopefully not find anything, but look for the things that we do need to watch out for from a safety point of view out on the road. Exactly. And, you know, you asked what are the common things. So pre-trip is one, lack of a pre-trip. If you're running ELDs, lack of instruction sheets, uh, those are easy tickets. But lights out. I can't tell you how often I'm reviewing a CVR or the SMS for if you're a cross-border carrier and I'm finding lights out. Well, isn't that, and let's be honest, we know that a light can, turn, can blow any time. For sure. Except how many times does a fleet get lights out? And when you see it repeated again and again and again, it's not that the lights are burning out. It's that the driver isn't checking, right. um, at least some of the time. Yeah, I yeah, know for sure. And that always would make me cringe when you, I mean, they look beautiful. You see them down the 401, the trailers that are front to nose to tail lights. And you're just like, oh. If one of those go out, <laughs> you're in some trouble. They look great, but that's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost like you're asking for trouble. But, you know, when they work, they're great. But, yeah, it always makes me cringe. You're like, oh, because <laughs> that's a lot to check. And like I said, it, it's a chance of one, you know, going out on the road is possible. And if you have 50 of them, you've got a better chance of one going out. <laughs> yeah, and just to be clear, what you're highlighting is the fact that if you've got a light on your unit, it has to light up. Right. Even if it's not required by leg, by re- tongue tie, by regulation, it has to light up. Yeah. So if it does blow out and it's not required, the easy answer is if you don't have a replacement light is to remove it. Yep. Yep. If it's not on there, not working, it's going to be a problem. Yep. <laughs> it, won't, it doesn't look as good on your truck, but. No. You know, it looks I, worse on your CVR rating now. <laughs> oh. and, and right now, as I say, uh, everybody is doing a really good job of cracking down. They're really trying to make, and you mentioned Humboldt, they're really trying to make the road safer. Um, MTO and all the provincial auditors and, and enforcement people are. And Humboldt has had a huge, I believe a huge impact. And it's something that's going to be impacting our, um, our industry for many years to come. I, I really hope we never forget Humboldt because all those people who aren't here anymore, they deserve to have something good come from that disaster. And, Agreed. you know, minimum entry level training is one of the things, but, you know, less hours of service violations, that driver that was involved in that crash uh, should have been put out of service right before that crash. Um, so less hours of service violations, better vehicle inspections, uh, better training of the drivers, ongoing training of the drivers. These are, I hope, are going to be the legacy of Humboldt and not all negativeness. Agreed. And I think you touched on a few things there when I'm thinking, you know, obviously a lot of CVR stuff is driven by the driver because they're kind of the last person to be in and out of the truck. Um, but I think you touched on a few things there of what can, you know, the fleets and the fleet managers and the state directors also be doing to ensure that the CVR stays in good standing. Well, one of the things is training. Uh, um, you know, if the best training I believe is one-on-one and then um, small groups in person and then large groups in person, that though is a lot of the time is really impractical. Uh, to get everybody together, most uh, businesses will bring their drivers together once or twice a year, buy them a meal, give them some swag and say, thanks boys, you know, good job and, and have somebody like an MTO officer or an OPP officer or a safety consultant come in and and talk to the troops. That's expensive and you're shutting your fleet down. So it makes it not very practical. Uh, So certainly online training 
is one thing that's available today. There's a number of different suppliers that offer really good stuff. And besides offering good education, they offer great documentation, which then satisfies the insurance people. It satisfies the MTO when they come in to say, hey, have you done any training? And in the worst case scenario, it really stands up well in court to say, you know, this was an accident. It wasn't our fault. It wasn't my driver's fault. Look at all the training we've done. He's a great human being. It was an accident. We're sorry for your loss. Right. That would be awesome. Yeah. And it makes sense. You want to make sure you're protected in the worst case. But at the end of the day, it's about putting safe guys on the road, you know, delivering the product safely. So, you know, in maximizing what you can do as, as a company owner, um, you know, or fleet director or whatever, whatever the role ends up being that kind of oversees the driver part, you know, ensuring that, that they are as trained uh, in, in every safety possibility as they can be to ensure that they know what they're doing and operating safely. And it's the best thing for the, on the roads, but obviously even for the company themselves, right? It ties back to them as well. Yeah, I mean, it allows the owners to sleep better at night <laughs> if they think they've taken every step reasonable to prevent crashes. Right. Then they can sleep and they deserve to sleep because, you know, they're the ones that have invested all this money. They're the ones that went out and bought the new trucks and the trailers and did the driver training. And, and all they're trying to do is provide a living for their family as well. Agreed. So obviously part of, of, of what you provide is, you know, when things go bad for people with their CVR and they've gotten their hand slapped by the MTO. And I can only imagine the, the grief that's causing even outside of just the potential insurance impact it's going to have. What, uh, what can fleets do to get back in good standing? Obviously, you know, the fractions will vary, but generally, what's, uh, you know, how painful is that process and how detailed is it to get back into good books? Well, you know that any infraction stay 24 months on the safety scores. So it takes a long time for it to improve. You need to take immediate steps to get it to improve now. Because when you roll across the scale, it doesn't matter what country you're in. When you roll across the scale, all they do is either punch in your, your CVR number or your plate number, and they know the history of your company. And they know what it is that they're gonna concentrate on. So the first thing is, is to look at your numbers, your safety score, analyze it, figure it out. What is it that's causing me all the problems? Is it lack of maintenance? Is it lack of driver training? Is it drivers not doing their vehicle inspection? Do I need to, to hound them again? Whatever it is, come up with a list and, and then do something proactive to um, help the drivers better navigate the, the whole process. You should be pulling your CVR. If you're a fleet of, I don't know, 15 or 20 trucks, I think you should pull your level two CVR every month. It's only five bucks. You need to know what is on there and you need to know when the drivers conveniently forget sometimes to turn in an inspection because that's going to hurt you for the next 24 months. And so you need to take some proactive steps. You need to know what is going on there and you don't need to be surprised when either the MTO comes knocking for an audit and by the way, even during COVID, they have now started to do remote audits, uh, believe it or not, um, or the insurance company comes in for an audit because they are auditing. Some insurance companies are starting with five trucks now and starting to audit them as small as five trucks. Several of them start at 10 or more and they're auditing them. And those audits have a lot to do with the price that you pay for insurance. And I've, you know, talking to some fleet owners about challenges they've had, you know, at the scales and infractions or even just comments that get put on, you know, the inspection that stick with them and they've got to go back and fight those. It's, uh, you know, some are warranted, some may not be, but it's, it's kind of like you said before, it's, it's providing all the ammo in the background and then trying to 
find out the ways where, hey, I'm not at fault here. This was you know, mis- misinterpreted, r- wrong guy, wrong day. You know, I mean, you have those. Um, but obviously that's something else that, you know, a fleet owner can do is make sure they are well-versed in what, everything they've done with the fleet and, you know, fight anything if they do feel it's, it's not appropriate against their, their rating. I was just going to say, if um, as a fleet owner, you get a ticket, the first call I would be making is to a really good qualified paralegal. That's not my expertise, but <laughs> call out a paralegal, ask them, what are my chances? Because apparently there's two things about a conviction. Um, the points for a conviction go back to the event date. That's mm. important because if you can delay getting convicted significant amount of time, like maybe six months, now it's only going to affect you for 18 months on your CVR. So that's the first thing. The second thing is a lot of the really good uh, paralegals can negotiate and they might plead guilty without delaying um, the six months, but they might plead guilty for something that's only one point instead of what you were charged with that might have been six. So they, that's their, their role. The ones that understand the CVOR really understand it well and they know how to negotiate with the Crown, how to plead guilty or when to plead guilty to a lesser charge. Uh, it may cost you the same amount of money, but that's not their role. They're not trying to save you money. They're trying to save you CVR points. Uh, and that's what they're, in most cases, that's what they're trying to do. So yeah, uh, fight your tickets if you get one. Uh, call a paralegal because the good ones are really good at it. Yeah. And I think, you know, and what you do and offer through through the safety dog, I think, just from the conversation here we've had you clearly identify a the need to understanding the cvor <laughs> its impact um and like i said the impact it has on the insurance uh but also the impact of having a proper safety program and either dedicated person or, or in the case of, of what you offer a, you know a consultant or a partner that will come in and work with you to wrap your head around this because in all fairness usually like you said, the smaller fleets that are maybe five trucks, traditionally trucking is not their core business. You know, they're probably a manufacturer of something that have five trucks because they need to. Um, but to wrap your head around everything you've just discussed uh, on top of what they're actually doing on a daily basis is is challenging, you know, let alone to do it right. So I think the, the value that, that you provide and what you do is is giving them someone with that level of expertise that a, they, they can't have on staff because they're just not big enough but they need because when things go wrong or even are just trending wrong, they need to figure out how to correct them. And they just don't, you know, they don't have that background. It's not their forte. Well, the biggest mistake I see fleets make is not getting their CVR often enough to look at it, to know what, when it's going wrong. Um, You know, I'm blessed with a lot of insurance brokers referring business to me because when they get the CVR and they have to take it to the (laughs) insurance company, they often will call me first and go, Oh my God, get in there. Yeah, um, you know, but before that happens, I wish the fleet owners would would um, pull their CVRs more frequently. And if they don't understand it, reach out. Um, you know, there's a lot of good safety consultants out there that do understand the CVR, and they'll spend time. Uh, you know, I I spend up to a half hour on the phone at no charge, just telling people. You know, God, this is my passion. Please <laughs> understand what the numbers are trying to tell you because it it's not once you know and you know how to read it it really the bad stuff jumps out at you really quick right and a lot of it's just like i said it's education right understanding it and if you don't know you ask and get get help and get support no different in any other aspect of their business you know and it's interesting to see and it's good to see you know the evening on the flip side the insurance companies you know pulling someone like yourself in to help work with them instead of just saying oh you know the CVR is bad let's jam them with this high rate because we have to it's hey let's help them let's try and work with them and like you said if they're not pulling their CVR on on any frequency they may have no clue of what's about to hit them if they're not paying attention yeah and the other part of that what you just mentioned was there's a difference between insurance companies and brokers. The insurance companies all have people on staff like me, the trucking insurance companies, and they're really not your enemy. If you own a fleet, they're really out there trying to help. They want to coach you to become a much better fleet. The unfortunate part is they can only come out to see you once or twice a year. So, and that's, 
kind of the role that I play, I fill those gaps in with a lot of companies because their insurance provider can only do that. If they came out much more frequently, then the, the trucking company would be in much better shape. But yep. nobody wants to pay them that much. You know. Yeah, no fair. And in all fairness, I mean, it, it should be on them to you know, make sure they're in good standing. No, like no difference that they would be with any other part of their business. You know, it's just, I think because it's not always their, their main business, it gets kind of pushed to the side and, you know, you can forget it. The same thing we do at home with certain things, you know, it's not what you focus on every day. And all of a sudden it's like, Whoa, where did that come from? So it can, if it's not what they do as a, as a business and the fleet's not big enough to support a single person, then it's definitely good to know the resources are there to, you know, raise their hand, reach out, you know, or even just revert back to what you, you do and put out there on the podcast and in the YouTube channel, right? At least it gets them going. If it, it engages conversation, engages thought, and then they can at least see, oh yeah, we're behind the eight ball or yeah, okay, we're trending okay. There's a lot of resources. I mean, God, Google's my best friend. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of resources. There's more channels on YouTube talking about these specific things. There may not be a lot of resources specifically for CBOR because Ontario, as much as we like to think we're the center of the world, they're, they're not, but there are three or four different channels that do talk about CBOR. There's some great blog articles from safety consultants on the internet that talk about the CBOR and how to read the CBOR. Um, and of course, there's always MTO. You can yeah. always reach out and, and download that 300 page book <laughs> and well there's only yeah there's about five chapters that are really really important in that book and you know it tells you what needs to be what your responsibilities are as a trucking company owner so yep. it makes it fairly simple you just have to like anything else you got to put the time in which is true. And, and you have, and you bring that wealth of knowledge to everyone who, who needs you when they can't wrap their head around what they need to do. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's good to have that, that resource that, that you bring and um, yeah, the, the expertise and the knowledge, I think definitely helps a lot of companies as they're struggling through or just trying to wrap their head around, well, you know, what, what they need to do. Yeah. Well, as you said, some company owners are so busy in other pieces of their business they just don't have the time to devote to learning this stuff. I mean, it's, there's, there's knowledge and that's all it is. I'm not any smarter than anybody else. I just happen to have been exposed to this for a long time. There's other aspects of trucking that I know nothing about. And, you know, I look pretty silly in some of those aspects. And some people would say I'm always kind of silly and don't know shit. But no, and I think the expertise that you bring, I think that's the value of as you grow a business, we talk to different, you know, people in history and everyone that's kind of been on our podcast, they all have an expertise in, in, in a certain aspect of the industry itself. Um, and that's the value they bring to their customers, to their company, uh, you know, whatever part it is. And then, you know, as you add all that together, the, the group becomes a whole and it becomes a fine tuned machine, but it's, you know, leveraging on people's experience and knowledge is what, is what helps everyone else get that a little bit better. Well, that's exactly, if I had to buy a new truck, I would come to the dealership and rely on the knowledge of a good quality salesperson to help me spec my truck. Right. Because that wouldn't be my forte. Right. Exactly. And that's what you, you lean to in all aspects of the business, right? Insurance be the same, you know, other components. Uh, and it's leaning on the individuals who, you know, have devoted a large chunk of what they do professionally to helping you navigate that area. Yep. Excellent. Well, look, I want to thank the time. Thank you for your time coming on, uh, digging into the CVR a bit, uh, giving everyone a background of what you do. I want everyone to make sure they check out your podcast and your YouTube channel. Uh, it's very informative. Uh, it's, it's great to watch you got great guests on there and the, the content's great and it's it's very frequent and updated often so it's it's definitely one to keep your eye on so i appreciate that what uh so everyone knows what is the youtube channel so everyone's looking at what are they looking for to find you there well if they want to go to youtube just google safety dog d-a-w-g and you'll find it or you can go to my website under the uh, resources page and you'll find all of the uh, youtube videos there Excellent. I encourage everyone to check it out as well. 
and get caught up on all the previous episodes. They they are great. And I think we, we share a few guests and we probably will going forward, just again, with the industry being as small as it is, but we're, we're talking with them on different things. So it's always interesting to get different takes of uh, people's career. Yeah, it's awesome. And thanks so much for having me on your show. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that concludes today's episode. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Chris Harris, the Safety Dog. And I remind you to subscribe and check out our page at rushtruckcenters.ca for all current and past episodes. And until next time, thanks for listening.